Kushutniak Park outside the Serbian capital, Belgrade. In May 1914, a Bosnian student, Gavrilo Princip, came here with a Browning pistol for some target practice. Princip was 19 years old. According to his instructor, he was not a very good shot. Other students were much more confident. Whenever Princip missed the target, people standing around would laugh at him. That would drive him to tears. Out of sight in the forest, he had a chance to get his eye in, shooting at trees. His ultimate goal was far more ambitious. I am an adherent of the radical anarchist idea, which aims at destroying the present system through terrorism. In 1914, Princip's wish was granted. The First World War began almost by accident. It ended just as strangely. In between, it was more destructive than any war had ever been. More British, French and Italian soldiers died in the First World War than died in the Second. It was the first genuinely global conflict, fought not just on the fields of France and Flanders, but up mountains, across deserts, at sea and in the air. The First World War shaped the 20th century. It sparked the Russian Revolution. It launched America as a world power. The fault lines from its failed peace settlement led the world to a second terrible war barely 20 years later, then to the Cold War. But the ideas the men of 1914 fought for still shape our world today. Nationalism and democracy, the rule of international law and the rights of nations. Now, after the collapse of communism, the European map resembles the one redrawn by the First World War. We live with its unresolved bitter consequences in the Middle East and the Balkans. And it was in the Balkans that it all began, nearly a hundred years ago. At the start of the 20th century, as at its close, the Balkans were the most unstable part of Europe. Here, three great empires fought for power and influence. The Austro-Hungarian, the Russian and the Ottoman. <laughs> For hundreds of years, the Ottoman Turks had the upper hand. Serbia, Bosnia, Albania were under their control. They built over 80 mosques in Serbian Belgrade, but by the 1900s, only this one was left. Serbia had thrown the Turks out and set herself up as an independent Slav kingdom. But right on Serbia's border was an even greater challenge to Slav nationalism, the Austro-Hungarian Empire. The old Turks of the south have gone, but new enemies come from the north, more fearsome and dangerous than the old. They want to take our freedom and our language from us and crush us. Gavrilo Princip was born in a poor, mountainous part of Bosnia. His house was destroyed in the Balkan Wars of the 1990s.
His initials carved in 1909 are one of the few signs he ever lived here. The year before, control of Bosnia had been wrested from the Turks by the Austro-Hungarians, the enemy Princip wanted to destroy. His particular target was the heir to the Austro-Hungarian throne, Franz Ferdinand, member of the ruling family, the Habsburgs. That extraordinary empire known as the Austrian-Hungarian dual monarchy is less an empire or a kingdom or a state than the personal property of the Habsburgs, whose hereditary talent for the acquisition of land is recorded on the map of Europe today. The empire was ruled by Franz Ferdinand's uncle, Franz Joseph. He sat on two thrones, as emperor of Austria and king of Hungary. By 1914, he'd been in charge for 66 years. He'd spent them trying to resist change of any kind. Hardly ever seen out of military uniform, he hated the idea of political reform. As he told US President Theodore Roosevelt, you see in me the last European monarch of the old school. Austria-Hungary was a key part of European security a multinational empire keeping the peace on the borders of the West. The capital, Vienna, was one of the great cosmopolitan centers of Europe. This was the empire that produced Freud and Mahler, Schiele, Kafka and Strauss. It contained at least 10 different nationalities, not just Austrians and Hungarians, but Czechs, Slovaks, Poles, Romanians, Italians, Croats and Bosnians. A guide was prepared by the British Foreign Office to help work out who was who. Teutons, anti-Slav, vigorous and... Un Very wooden and hard-headed, shy and suspicious, close-fisted. Very tall, big noses. Slovaks, ignorant but artistic. Ruthenes, savage and ignorant but... Czechs. Musical. Energetic, forceful, intensely... But it was also an empire in a state of constant crisis. Poles all for Polish independence. Bosnian Serbs, pro-Yugoslav, Italians, anti-Austrian. In all the empire, only the Hungarians and Austrians had any real power, and the Hungarians refused to share it with the rest. For countries like Serbia, Austria-Hungary was the prison of nations, a repressive, undemocratic state that ground small peoples under its heel. In 1905, there were nationalist demonstrations in Vienna. In 1912, there was rioting in Budapest. By 1914, there'd been ethnic unrest in nearly every part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Local parliaments were suspended, troops brought in to restore order. Austria-Hungary's domestic problems gave opportunities to her enemies. Serbia wanted the breakup of the empire. She welcomed national unrest particularly in Croatia and Bosnia. Backed by Slav Russia, Serbia saw herself as the only independent hope for Slavs living under foreign rule in the Balkans. She wanted to unite them into a single South Slav state, Yugoslavia. Dragutin Dimitrievich was an officer in the Serbian army. He opposed any kind of friendship with Austria. The blind surrender to Austria's embrace was a most shameful betrayal of Serbian traditions. 
I realized that Serbia must in full measure become the leader, not only of Serbs, but of Yugoslavia. Dmitrievich believed killing kings could bring political change. It had worked for him in the past. In 1903, he led a palace revolution, killing the old king of Serbia, who was too close to Austria for the army's liking, and installing a new one. The crowds expressed enormous joy. They stuck flowers and leaves in their caps. Windows were decorated with banners, flowers, garlands. Belgrade was celebrating. The rest of the world was horrified at Serbia's bloody coup. Serbia was treated like a rogue state. A nest of revolutionaries, one foreign minister complained. Only two countries sent ambassadors to King Peter's coronation. Russia, Serbia's greatest ally, and Austria, her greatest enemy. Dmitrievich was also one of the founding members of the Black Hand, a secret military society that used terrorism and assassination to try and establish Yugoslavia. He is said to have sent men to murder Austro-Hungarian military leaders and cabinet ministers. He allegedly tried to kill Emperor Franz Joseph. One saw him nowhere, yet one knew that he was doing everything. By the spring of 1914, Gavrilo Princip was also in Belgrade, talking revolution with his friends. Then the young Bosnians heard that Archduke Franz Ferdinand would visit Sarajevo in June. Here was their chance to match deeds to words. Luckily for them, their plans reached the ears of Dmitrievich and the Black Hand. Dmitrievich worked in the Kalamigdan Fortress in Belgrade as Chief of Serbian Military Intelligence. In the spring of 1914, Major Voya Tankasic, also in the Black Hand, walked into his office with a question. I've got some Bosnian youths pestering me. These kids want to pull off some great deed at any cost. They've heard that Franz Ferdinand is coming to Bosnia and have begged me to let them go there. What do you say? I've told them they cannot go, but they give me no peace. Franz Ferdinand was going to Bosnia to observe the Austro-Hungarian army's maneuvers in the hills outside Sarajevo. As intelligence chief, Dmitrievich feared these maneuvers were a smokescreen, that what Franz Ferdinand really planned was an invasion of Serbia. As leader of the Black Hand, he believed anything that destabilized Austria-Hungary was good for his beloved Serbia. Princip's plan to murder Franz Ferdinand suited him perfectly. Fine, he said. Let him go. Unlike Gavrilo Princip, Archduke Franz Ferdinand was an excellent shot. One of his castles, Konopisht, in what is now the Czech Republic, is full of the evidence. By the age of 50, he'd shot 5,000 stags, as well as 200,000 other animals, all carefully numbered. Anyone who disturbed the Archduke's peace at Konopisht by trespassing on his land, as unsuspecting trippers sometimes did on Sundays, had to reckon with being 